So half an hour every morning I just give a spiel called expostulation uh, on the theory of translating. So this is uh, a page out of a, out of a proposal we gave to a major Chinese sponsor whose name you may know uh, for $880,000 for this year. And he semi-agreed, but he can't get money out of China right now. So my proposal was that uh, translators deserve more respect, because they don't get much respect <laughs> in, in the world. No, I mean, they've starved forever. And uh, I wanted to pay $40,000 US to each translator every year. And that would cost about a million dollars. And uh, the whole program would cost about a million dollars. I would like to get other uh, Tibetan speakers here, uh, people who can teach you debate in Tibetan, you know, experts, expert translators, people who are pretty good. And um, so we're waiting to see if, what happened was because of Bush, uh, sorry, what's his name? Trump. Uh, the, uh, the dollar got very strong, uh, which means that every time a dollar goes to a foreign country, more yuan goes to a foreign country, and 20% more. So every day the Chinese government loses more, 20% more money than they did a, a month ago. So they just shut down on, on foreign, foreign transmit, uh, transmittals. You can't send money overseas easily right now. And that'll change, it always changes, but anyway, so that didn't work. And we cobbled together a program, and actually we have a sponsor for the first two terms, who's another Chinese businessman. and. Um, we should send him a thank, a thank you somehow. And uh, maybe after we're done today or something, we can turn off all the, you know, when we should all say hi and thank you. Because I, um, that's a new person who, who's been very generous. And I, I met them in, in an airport. <laughs> we had a meeting. In, I, I routed my plane to Canada and we had a meeting. In, it was crazy. But anyway, it worked. <laughs> so um, they donated $50,000 for the first two terms so that you could have scholarships. Um, okay. Uh, this is part of a proposal that I wrote called 10,000, which is the idea is that if you calculate it out, if we take five generations, 150 years, generation is about 30 years um, for Buddhism, you could uh, finish 10,000 
the 10,000 cortex, which I think are all you really need uh, to change our world. So, uh, and it would take 200 translators. So each of you has to create three or four, and then they have to create three or four, and it'll be okay. We'll work it out. Uh, and uh, the proposal was, it's part of the college. By the way, the newspaper just ran an article, the local newspaper, about uh, this is the land we want to buy. It was a park. It was a, a venue for concerts and stuff. They built this huge thing, this extremely huge. And then the, the local people killed it because they didn't want the traffic. The people around here are very, very tough about environment. Uh, so they killed. They said you can have one content a month. Uh, and uh, so they killed it. And the land has been empty for five years or something. And this thing is all falling down. And, uh, so uh, anyway, if you want to read it, the, the current owner's stalling. And they, wanted, they wanted to do something with it. Uh, but they, people like our proposal. So if we build a larger university, the idea is that uh, there's like a world, you're the worldview department. You see what I mean? It's, it's kind of like uh, back in the Red Guard days. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you, you, you create the worldview here, and then uh, somebody interprets it, which is the DCI people, and then they educate all the other departments of the university. So we'd like to have at the university medical department, which would mainly be stem cell stuff, which Mr. Dr. Wu is really one of the leading people in the world on it, you know. And uh, me and V went and got one, uh, what, six months, a couple months ago. Uh, she, she wanted one, I didn't want one. So I said, okay, I'll go. And I think it's pretty cool. Uh, and uh, I think it's going to be a big thing. The owner, the current owner of the land, Mr. Tennyson, he, um, we were afraid to tell him about the stem cell research and, and uh, treatment facility. And uh, we kind of talked to him very gently. And, and then he said, uh, my, you know, just forget it. I got my stem cell treatment yesterday. <laughs> you know, because <laughs> he had a hip operation. And the doctor said you should have a stem cell treatment before and after. And um, so he did it. And it's extremely expensive right now. It's probably about $15,000 of treatment, 20000 in China. Uh, what, no, here. Uh, and then um, they're trying to synthesize the drugs that are necessary to, to uh, what do you call it, petri dish the stem cells. And until they can do that, it's going to be expensive. So it's going to be for rich people. So anyway, uh, we're trying to, they're trying very hard to synthesize it. And they probably will. I think uh, Dr. Wu sponsored Jigmei to go have one before her operation. She had a knee, knee procedure. So anyway, uh, we'd like to have a medical facility and uh, then we medical research and treatment. And then we'd like to have an uh, environmental sciences department and a uh, high-tech department. So Mr. Wu's idea, when I like it, is that we shouldn't just have a Dharma University, because it tends to get uh, incestuous somehow. And, you know, like Diamond Mountain, frankly, when in the old days, it was just, everyone's just doing this thing, and there's no, nobody learned how to do anything, practical skill that they can help people with their hands. And then if you just live in your head, you tend to get strange. So I think it'd be cool if everybody in the university also had a second avocation, like they could do some medicine or they could do some environmental science or they could do some kind of programming in addition to their other skills. So, but the, the translation department would feed the worldview department. The worldview department would do its best. There would be a requirement that all engineering students, all medical students have to take a, a DCI courses uh, to get them to understand that, you know, for medicine to work, that patient has to help another sick person. See what I mean? Which doesn't mean you don't do stem cell research. It means you do stem cell research and you teach people to help sick people. So that's the idea. So this department feeds into the, you know, worldview 
Enforcement department. <laughs> That's where it gets a little touchy. That's where it gets like the red guard. You got to be careful with that kind of thing. You can't force people to. You can't like become fanatical about it and force people. It's a very delicate thing, and and in the hands of a less intelligent people, it, it could get that way. You know, everyone has to accept worldview. So, in a gentle way, an intelligent way, we encourage people to think that way. But to, to feed into that, you need translators. Because you need data to go into the worldview department, you know. So that was the proposal. And, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a five-generation proposal. Uh, I had this weird idea that maybe, uh, maybe fostering this kind of thinking created Mr. Wu. Mm -hmm. And it created him, cre maybe that we're teaching this ideas created Dr. Wu, right, for me, you know, and created the stem cell, the, his interest in stem cell treatment, you know, so, you know what I mean? Uh, it's just possible. And then maybe people really could live longer. So, uh, and they're close to developing major advances in science. There's, there's two tracks in science right now, medical science. And Dr. Wu thinks, by the way, that keeping people alive longer will be the new, for the last 30 years, it was communications. Mm -hmm. New phones, new computer, new Bluetooth, everything, you know. And then he thinks it's going to shift to keeping people alive because the people are getting older. The, the population of the world is getting older. So um, that's, that's going to become the, the most interesting thing for people is to how to stretch your active years. They call 60s the new 40s or something like that. <laughs> There's a joke like that, but it's true, I think, you know, because we can be healthy enough to continue through our 60s and 70s. So, um, so anyway, uh, part, of the, part of the proposal, I don't know, it was a 20-page proposal for the, for the $800,000, $880,000. Part of the proposal was, uh, was this, and I wanted to go over that this morning. And I have 10 more minutes. I call T-A-R-R, -R. I guess we call, call it TAR. And, uh, and I was quite frank with Dr. Wu, you know. He, he would like to see us do more Chinese classics and things like that. You know, these are the Kangir in, in Chinese. Uh, and they have to be updated to modern Chinese. Uh, I, if I'm Correct. It's hard for most Chinese people to read this. Uh, so, especially since the alphabet was, since the characters were simplified by the, after the communist revolution, right? So, um, we'd like to update those. You can either take them and just retranslate them from those, mm -hmm. but I think a lot of the translations may be not so great. So, I think the better way is to go through what we're doing. You I, I can only translate into English. So we translate them into English, and then we translate them back into modern Chinese. And I think it will be more accurate. Uh, because of the Geshe training is so strict, uh, that the translation comes out more strict, I think. Uh, so anyway, these are my proposal. There's four parts to it. And I feel very strongly about it. Like, I'm not interested in anything else. If you got to stick to these four, is what I'm saying, in this room. And if you don't like it, just go somewhere else. You know, go join some other thing. You know, I'm just, my old age, I don't have time to uh, accommodate people. You know, this is my belief. It's from a, a whole lifetime of working. I work on these books every day, hundreds of gopher searches, every day, for my whole life. And, and uh, still crazy still doing two crazy major translations and uh, it takes many hours a day and uh, so anyway here we go uh, I want to stick to Tsongkhapa and his and his lineage okay and there's nothing like it nothing and I've studied you know I bought the books for the Library of Congress I, I was hired to buy all their Tibetan books for Ten years, I was des I was asked to design a purchasing program, and I did it. And uh, eight thousand books, and uh, 
There's nothing like Tsongkhapa. I saw, I saw every monastery in Nepal, Sikkim, Bhutan, India. I paid for them to come and show me their books in New Delhi. And there's nothing like Tsongkhapa, okay? As far as I, I saw everything, all the sex, and all, I paid for, I took my salary and gave it to them. And uh, they brought their books. And uh, there's nothing like Tsongkhapa, okay? So anyway, uh, <coughs> And because his worldview is so correct that it could make for a, a, a perfect world, a world without war or hunger, okay? I believe that. So people, I, I said yesterday, people asked me, what, what are you, Buddhist? Are you Galupa? Are you follow Dalai Lama? I say, I follow Tsongkhapa, you know. Uh, so I, I, we're going to focus on that lineage. And, and there are 10,000 books within that lineage, if you include the books from India. So Tsongkhapa was very strict about only using books, the great books from India. He was very, very strict. He didn't use anything else. And you, when you read his, we're doing uh, Gombarapsa, his, his classic on emptiness. And uh, to do the footnotes takes more time than the translation. Because he just quotes India. You know, he quotes Buddha. So he's very strict and very careful about it. And very cool, you're going to see it today with uh, Kunshi. It's a difficult text, but no one has written a better one. And no one's clarified it since then. Uh, there's a couple of commentaries, but I'm not satisfied with them. So we're going to go to him, and it's, maybe I'll get lost at some point, but, but I don't see any choice. I don't see any better presentation on the Laya Vijnana, uh, Mind Only School. Okay. I, I don't think there's anything better. The book I had chosen turns out to be an, an extended debate about, you know, whether the Kunshi relates to the formless realm, the whole book. <laughs> and uh, it's just, I mean, that should be translated by your students, okay? By the way, we're, we get to do the greatest books. We're the first <laughs> generation. I'm so happy, you know. Your students' students will be scraping the bottom of the barrel for some minor commentary and bone. You get to do the classics. You get to do the most important books, okay? Choni Lama. By the way, there's a lot more Choni Lama stuff. Mm. There's a great text on uh, mental functions, mm. uh, Buddhist psychology. Wow. There's a beautiful text on Buddhist psychology. So anyway, uh, accuracy. Accuracy doesn't mean, and here I, you know, I'll get passionate about translation. It doesn't mean uh, converting all the words into English or Chinese, okay? It doesn't mean take this word, turn, you know, it doesn't mean that. You have to catch the meaning, okay? You're not word, uh, you're not hypertext machines in reverse, <laughs> you know? You're not just uh, changing words. And, you know, I thought we could sit here and read some bad translations together, but it's too depressing, <laughs> you know? I, <laughs> <laughs> I can't do it. I don't want to do it. Uh, but uh, it's not the exercise of changing words. Um, it's accuracy means catch the nuance. Nuance in English means the... Like yesterday, we, the guy was hiding Tsongkhapa's words in the book, right? Mm -hmm. You have to know. You know he, the, guy, the guy used part of a famous part of one of... You know, turn your mind to the path which pleases the Buddhas, you know. And he said that students should turn their mind to the path that pleases the wise. He was making a, you have to catch all these things. You have to show them. Uh, and, and if you don't, the book's not accurate. You can translate all the words, but the book's not accurate if you don't catch the nuances. And, uh, and if you literally translate all the words, you ruined it. And it sounds bad, okay? So accuracy doesn't just mean word for word. And there won't always be a word for word. Uh, and I'll tell you one example that I want you to think about. Uh, don't look for word to word. Mm -hmm. uh, don't look for one English word that covers one Tibetan word or one Sanskrit word. Forget it. English is, English is a very, very rich language. It comes from many, many sources. But one of the greatest 
richnesses of the English language is two word verbs. Mm -hmm. Put me on, put me off, put me over, put me under, put me around. <laughs> you okay. see, and they all have different meanings. So if you look for one word for one Sanskrit word, forget it. In English you might have to use two words. And, and only lately are English dictionaries using two word verbs. You know, put away, put, put me under means anesthesia. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it's weird. English is, you got to use these. You can't do one word for one word, okay? It won't come out. It's not accurate, okay? All right. Mm. Text should be readable, okay? We called it in my diamond business. And then I'll, you know, in my diamond business, we called it the secretary test. So we had 800 people in our building in New York. We had 10,000 people in other countries. And uh, we all jewelry experts, you know. So we would design new pieces. We designed like 30 pieces every week, new. We had thousands of pieces in our catalog. And uh, so to us, we'd say, oh, this is a beautiful new piece of jewelry. You know, this is going to be so popular. And then we had a secretary test. So we'd go to the secretary we go to some secretary who doesn't know anything about jewelry. We say, what do you think about this ring? She says, that's really ugly. <laughs> you know, because <laughs> she's the real person who's going to buy it. You see what I mean? So it doesn't matter how you feel about it. It matters how your audience feels about it. It should be easy to read, okay? And uh, you can go on Amazon. I could do it now, but it's kind of cruel. Take any translation. <laughs> and, you know, I have a friend who's a great translator. And I went to see, uh, their book came out like, they translated a major Sanskrit book. Very important Sanskrit book. And I went to see uh, how many people reviewed it in the last 10 years. Guess. Six. One. One. One person. You know, and it's number like 5 billion on Amazon. It means 4 billion books are in front of it. You know. So, it's got to be readable. Normal people have to be able to read it. I was thinking about the footnote problem. <laughs> uh -huh. Some of those footnotes are half a page. See, I just think, yeah. Yeah. you know, a, a good Buddhist translation footnote might be half a page or even a page. So, I, I don't know how that will work out. Yeah. Let's look at it again. <laughs> it's a, let's, I'm open to debate. Okay, last <laughs> thing. I mean, I'm not that open. Uh, uh, <laughs> you can admit. Okay, the translation must be relevant to the modern world. Okay, and uh, that's the big breakthrough of DCI. You know, uh, DCI taught twenty thousand people last year, and and very few are Buddhist. You know, not um, very few are Buddhist. There's some Muslim people here in this course from Syria, the guy was signed up from Kazakhstan, he couldn't get a visa from some country. Uh, and uh, it, should be a, it should be relevant to modern people, okay? And, and you have to make it relevant to modern people, okay? You can't just crank out some obscure thing that's gonna, no one's opened these books in 10 years, you know? Uh, so, you know, it should be an accurate translation, but then you should see that it's carried to the modern world. There should be some application to the modern world. So as you translate, I want you to think about your next book about that subject, which is going to be a DCI type of book. You know, you're going to say, now that I'm an expert in Kunchi, you know, foundation consciousness, you know, I'm going to teach people how to plant better seeds for medical treatments or something, you know, based on my knowledge of so you have to be, in the back of your mind, you have to think about the lectures you're going to give and the, the books you're going to write in your own language for your own people based on what you learned in Abhidharma. You know? The whole four steps that uh, DCI is built on comes from the fourth chapter of the Abhidharma Kosha. Everything. You know? The, th the four steps comes from the fourth chapter. And, you know, that sat in that book for <laughs> 1,300 years, 1,700 years. And, and people didn't use it. Just nobody used it. It was just some <laughs> philosophy thing that the monks use. The monks don't use it. 
they just debate it so they can get their geshe so they can go to Australia. <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> you know, so, uh, right? <laughs> there's a brain drain from the, <laughs> yeah. there's more geshe in Australia than, than in Sarah. Uh, teaching two people each. Uh, so anyway, um, not kidding. Uh, so anyway, uh, should be relevant to the modern world. As you translate, think, how can I use this in a DCI course? Because you know, you're going to write the next DCI generation courses, not me. I will be on my, in my rocking chair, <laughs> on my porch. Oh, you know my house. I'll be watching the trees. So, you know, you have to think about how to use it, how to, how to teach people. How would you use this, how would you use your translation in a, in a DCI course? There, there's 400 people there. Then how, well, how would you use it? Okay, all right. We're not just doing old philosophy. And in the time of the Buddha, it was alive. And somewhere between there and here, it got old. It got... It got monastic, you know, people stopped thinking about it. People stopped using it for other people, okay? It just became some temple thing, okay? So we gotta try not to go there. Okay, close your, turn your computer down. Now, the principle of our translation is tar, T-A-R-R, -R. who can give me tea? It's yeah, it's on copying. Okay, it's on copying. And I'm not, you know, outside this room, I'm very cool. <laughs> oh, you're, oh, yeah, that's, oh, yeah. What do they call it? Uh, you're Dzogchen. Oh, that's cool, you know, I like Dzogchen. But in this room, it's like, okay. Uh, what's the other thing? What's the second accurate, one? Accurate. Yeah, accurate. Meaning all the shades of meaning, okay? Catch all the shades, of, and it's difficult. You have to know the language really well. You have to know the philosophy. Third one. Read a book. Yeah. Easy, easy to read. Easy to read. As easy as you can make it. Some books are not going to be easy for you know, they're physics books. Yeah. It's not going to be easy. But don't make it more difficult for the person. Don't put extra blocks in their way. You know. Like, and make it as easy as you can, as readable as you can. It may be difficult, but readable. Okay, the fourth one? Relevant. Yeah, it should apply to the modern world. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I figured that was a good time. We already all got it right. <laughs>